chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Is this thing working? All right, good, good. We'd like to welcome everybody here today. Glad you're here. Have a chance to come together and to study God's Word and look at some of the amazing things that He has recorded for us in His Word and how we can apply those things to our life. We're here to worship God. We love Him. We like to praise Him. We like to study His Word. We love one another. And we reach out to the lost as we grow to God's glory here at Palm Springs Church of Christ. Thank you for being here today. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're here as well as we have a chance to look into God's Word. At the end of the book of Acts, Paul is sharing the gospel to some very important people by worldly standards. And as he shares the gospel to them, he couples the gospel message with the message of his own salvation and what Christ has done for him in his life. And I think that's a very important part of what evangelism really is. It's telling people what Jesus has done for us, and it's also telling people what Jesus has done for me specifically and how he has changed my life and how he's made my life so much better and so much different. And I think as God's people, we should couple those two things together as we try to reach the lost. And, and Paul's not the only one that did that through Scripture. It is what Jesus wanted people to do through Scripture. Go tell people what I have done for you. And that's sort of our thought this morning, the importance of telling people what Jesus has done for us. We're going to look at a story in the beginning of the book of Mark, and we're going to look at three different elements of this. First of all, we're just going to lay the groundwork out there. We're going to share the setting, what, how this story takes place. Then we'll look at the story itself, and then we will look at the result of this particular story. So there's a man who was possessed by demons, and this man ended up being a great spreader of the gospel. But it's good to be here and be able to be a part of God's people. So in Mark chapter 1 is where we start off here. In Mark chapter 1, you have this idea of uh, John the Baptist is on the scene. He's preparing the way of the Lord. John starts going to, John goes to prison. Jesus takes over. Before he goes to prison, John baptizes Jesus. Satan tempts Jesus. John's arrested. Jesus starts his ministry. He calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be his disciples. And the popularity of Jesus just gets getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. There's a man in Capernaum. Jesus is in the synagogue. And I just want you to imagine this for a second. He's in a synagogue, and he begins to teach. And the people are amazed by the things that Jesus is teaching there in that synagogue. And while he's teaching in that synagogue, a man who is possessed by a demon yells right in the middle of that assembly and says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Could you imagine that? And then all of a sudden, Jesus rebukes him and tells him to be quiet. Let's look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 25. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. I would say so. You know, everybody started talking about this. Could you imagine if you were that lame man and G or that man possessed by a demon and Jesus has cast that demon out of you and how you would have wanted to tell everybody that particular story? What if you were in the synagogue that day and you had seen what had happened and you were amazed by this? Chances are you would have gone on and said there was a guy in a synagogue and I think it's a carpenter's son, but there was a demon-possessed man that cried out, saying who he was. He rebuked him. He convulsed on the ground. The spirit came out. That story would have gone over and over and over again. And that's why his fame was spreading. After this, they leave the synagogue. They go to Peter's house. Well, what does he do at Peter's house? He heals Peter's mother-in-law. And after that, there's a Sabbath. After the Sabbath day, it says that he healed all kinds of people that day. And then and look at verse 35. It said, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, 
he went out and departed to a solitary place and there prayed. You can see that, the fame spreading, people around you. One of the most, an amazing thing about the life of Jesus is that no one ever respected his personal space and he never got a break. I mean, he was 24 7, people wanted something from him. And we're going to see that as we continue. Verse 36. And Simon, and Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. So after he spent the day healing all these people who were sick and casting out demons, it says that everybody was looking for him. And a leper finds him. And this leper comes up to Jesus and falls at Jesus' feet and says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, there's a couple elements of faith. You have to believe that God is willing and that he is able. All right. So Jesus says, I am willing, be cleansed. Now, Jesus does something else here. He reaches out and touches the man. And in reaching out and touching the man would have been a no-no for most people. But for Jesus, when Jesus touches someone who is unclean, Jesus doesn't become unclean. The one who is unclean becomes clean. It says his leprosy immediately left him. Verse 42, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So Jesus strictly warns this guy. I think part of the reason is because the crowds are getting so large, Jesus is having a hard time even training his own apostles to some degree. They're pressing against him, they're requiring his time. And the more and more the story goes out about what he's able to do, the less and less time he's going to have to do things like this, and the more and more demanding the crowds are going to be on him. But if you look at verse 45, it says that the guy told anyway. Even a strict warning by the man who saved him wasn't enough to get this guy to hold this story in. And have you ever noticed that about a story that you've lived through or an occasion, something that's happened to you or a story that you've heard? If it is an interesting, compelling story, how hard is it to keep that in? Almost impossible, right? You just want to tell somebody what took place this day. You saw something amazing. You've heard something amazing. And you want to share it with everybody. And that's what this man was feeling. I had leprosy. And now I don't have leprosy anymore. And I'm sure as people ask, he just bubbled out the answer. Yeah, this man, he healed me of this leprosy. He not only healed me, but he touched me in the process. In chapter 2, we're going to have to go back and tell this story eventually. It's when the man is lowered through the roof and everybody's in that house. There's no room in that house. They're listening to Jesus. They're amazed by what he says. And he, he tells them his sins are forgiven. And then he says, rise, take up your bed and walk. No one has ever seen this before. Jesus' fame keeps growing more and more and more. Now look at Mark chapter 3 and verse 8. Mark chapter 3 and verse 8. He's also healed a man with a, lither, a withered hand on the Sabbath day. About the middle of verse 8 it says, A great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they crush him. So Jesus, instead of cutting off the escape boat, which we had in our story this morning, what Jesus says is you, we need an escape boat. We need to get a boat at the ready so that if need be, I can get in that boat so the multitudes do not crush me. Verse 10, for he healed many so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he strictly warned them that they should not make him known. So in chapter 4, Jesus ends up taking advantage of this escape boat. 
And chapter 4 begins with Jesus getting in that boat and he, they uh, row him out a little bit from the shore. All the people are on the, shore, on the seashore. They're looking at Jesus. Jesus is sitting down in a boat because the crowds are so large. They're pressing against him. They've heard of all these miracles he's done. They want to see him. They want to hear him. On that particular day, Jesus teaches the parables, parable of the sower. He teaches parables all day long. He teaches some of the kingdom parables that day. He teaches the purpose of parables that day. And late in the evening, he tells his disciples, it's time for us to go to the other side of the sea. So the disciples take him to the other side of the sea. And it's not just, get the picture here. I think it's important that we get the picture. Jesus is in a boat with his apostles but there are also many other boats, smaller boats, that are going across the Sea of Galilee with Jesus in the larger boat. When they are on the Sea of Galilee, a storm arises. The Bible tells us it comes out of nowhere. And it is a great storm. So think about this for a second. Has anybody here ever been in on the water and a big storm came up that you weren't expecting? Okay? Okay. Has anybody been on the water like this and you actually felt you were going to die? Okay. I think you're in trouble. I don't know. I think this is all your fault. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, and that's what happens. The apostles think they're starting to dry. And the description that the, these three gospel writers tell us, the waves are coming over the boat. And the boat is starting to fill with water. And they are frantic. They have been on the Sea of Galilee before. They know what these storms are like. But these men are scared to death. Jesus, in contrast, is asleep in the front of the boat on a pillow. Now, it's important as we look at these stories, these real stories that happen, to sort of put yourself in those. So, right now, we're in this boat with Jesus... There's this huge storm. We're soaking wet. We're trying to get the water out of the boat as fast as we can. We're frantic. We're desperate. We just don't know what else to do. And I always tell people when I get to this part of the, of the story, I would be having my head over the boat throwing up. I get seasick. I would have been one throwing up. I wouldn't know what to do. But eventually they decide, we got to wake Jesus up. And so who does that? We're not told. The disciples wake Jesus up and they say, don't you care that we are perishing here? And Jesus gets up, disappointed in his disciples for their lack of faith. And he calms the winds and the waves. So and we're going like this. We're soaking wet. And all of a sudden Jesus says, peace be still. And the text says there is a great calm. Now, you probably have all have been on the water when there's no waves whatsoever, right? And how peaceful and relaxing that can be. So you go from this major storm where you're scared to death almost in an instant where it's as calm as glass, no wind at all. And you're like, you just can't believe what you just experienced. The disciples then in the back of the boat are huddled together and they ask this question who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey his voice all those other stuff we've talked about for the setting they saw all that stuff right but there was something about being at the point of death and seeing Jesus react where the winds and the waves obey his very voice that got them wondering, who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey his voice? So that's the setting of our story. That's where we are in the life of Jesus and the life of his apostles. Now, God could have answered this question any way he chose to. Already when Jesus was baptized, he spoke from heaven, right? You are my son, I am pleased with you, or this is my beloved son, and who I am well pleased. God could have answered that question then and there by speaking out of heaven. Jesus could have turned and just told them, you guys don't get it yet? You've, seen, you've heard all the demons. 
What are the demons saying about me? They're all saying that I am the Holy One of God. You know, get it into your skull. But God has a very memorable way of letting the disciples know who Jesus is. So picture us all now coming on to the shore. Those of us who were in the larger boat with Jesus knows what we know what happened. Those who were in the smaller boats might not have any idea how that wind was solved, how that storm was solved. They're coming on board, and boy, do they have questions. And there's got to be the relief of just being now on land where you almost want to fall down on the ground and kiss the ground you're on because now this is solid ground. I feel safe now. Finally, I am safe from this wind and all that good stuff. I'm glad to be on land. But there's no rest because two extremely violent, ext extremely strong, demon-possessed men start running at Jesus. And two of the accounts say only mention one of them, probably because there was one that was a lot worse and one that may have been a lot well-known to the community. So that's the, the, the legend, if you will, sort of goes from him. But one of the accounts says there's two guys running. So just imagine this. They're running towards Jesus. They have no clothes on. They hadn't worn clothes in a long time. They have cuts all over their bodies from where they have been cutting themselves with pottery. They have lived in the tombs. Now, one thing my mom and dad never, ever, ever had to worry about me, even on Halloween, is going to a cemetery. I was not going to go to a cemetery. I don't like cemeteries at night. No, no, you could have triple dog dared me a thousand times. I'm not. These guys lived in the cemetery. People have been trying to tame them for years by binding them with chains. And as they put these shackles and these chains on them, these demons, were, these demons gave them so much power, they just broke them like they were nothing. And they start running at Jesus. Pause just for a second here. What would you have done? I mean, okay, I like that. I'm thinking like, all right, this is the guy that just stopped the storm and the wind. Let's just back up a little bit and let him take charge of this. Who knows? Maybe they all did try to step up to protect Jesus. We don't have any indication of what they did, but it would be an interesting scene to be in, right? You just landed and you're trying to figure out these guys are walking. Everybody in this area has been afraid of these two for a long time and now he, they're running full blast at Jesus. And when they get to Jesus, they fall down on their knees. And they begin to worship him. Let's look at Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said... What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. The apostles just got out of the boat. What were they wondering in the boat? Who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey his voice? Well, God has their answer for them. I think this is, it's, I smile when I read this, right? I smile because, God, okay, I'm going to give you your answer, but I'm going to give you your answer in a way that you never would have expected. I'm going to give you your answer by letting demons tell you who this is. And so this scene plays out where now they know that he is the son of the most high God. So Jesus says, who are you? What is your name? And verse 9, it says, and he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountain. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Again, what an overwhelming sight this would have been. This demon-possessed man that everybody had been afraid of for all these years is now at the feet of Jesus. And all these demons are asking Jesus permission, please, 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 please don't torment us. Please don't destroy us. Please give us permission to go over into those pigs over there. 
I am convinced that if we had walked with Jesus, our eyes would have been this big all the time. I mean, my eyes would have been like, this is amazing. I mean, you have these demons down here begging this man to be able to go into those pigs. Verse 13, and at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So 2,000 pigs then were possessed by these demons, and they drowned in the sea. And I don't know what this looked like either. You wonder if there's any kind of visual representation of these demons actually leaving this man and going over to the pigs. Or you wonder if it's just nothing that happens, and then all of a sudden you look up and all these pigs are violently running down this hill, and they're all running to see the Sea of Galilee, and that's where they drown. The men who are responsible for taking care of these pigs had to be scared to death to go tell the people that hired them they've just lost 2,000 pigs. They go to the city, and it says they go throughout the country telling the people what had just happened. And, and could you imagine this? Uh, you know the guy that was possessed by all those demons? The ones that we've all been afraid of all these years? The ones that we've tried to chain and shackle and all that good stuff? Well, this man came along, and those, that guy ran up to this man and started calling him the Holy One of God, bowing down to him, and all those demons started speaking, asking permission, and they just went on telling everybody that to where the people in the, in the region came down to see what was taking place, especially the people who own the pigs. When they get down to the sea, they start asking questions of the other people that are there. So the other people who had witnessed all this started telling them, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And so when they collected all this information and they did the investigation, they looked at Jesus and said, please leave our region. Please get out of here. Jesus does. He gets back in his boat and we need to read Mark chapter 5, 18 through 20. Mark 5, 18 through 20, because this is where our main point of the lesson is. And when he got back into the boat, speaking of Jesus, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Now you have the, the Sea of Galilee, and on the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee is this region called the Decapolis, the ten city region. And there's one city on that, right on the seashore, that probably is where all this took place. But this man, what he does when Jesus says, you can't go with me, I don't want you to go with me. And instead of telling him, like he told the others, don't tell anybody, he actually tells him, what I want you to do is I want you to go tell all of your friends how the Lord had compassion on you and tell, him all, tell them all the great things the Lord has done for you. Jesus leaves. He and his apostles leave. They travel for a while. In Mark chapter 7, they come back to the region. We're going to read Mark chapter 7, and we're going to look at, read Matthew's account of this same story. So this guy, what this guy's been doing for the whole time Jesus has been gone, he's been telling everybody, you look at what Jesus did for me, and what does it say about that? They were all amazed, right? They were all amazed by this. In Mark 7, and verse 31, it says, Again, departing for the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue, and looking up into heaven, he said, Be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, 
and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more wildly they proclaimed it. Widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Now let's look at Matthew's account. Because Matthew's account says it a little bit differently. Look at Matthew chapter 15. This is the same account as recorded by Matthew. And Matthew's account makes it seem, to me at least, that as he comes back to this same region and they hear that he's there, they throng him. A bunch of people come up to him wanting him to perform a miracle. And wouldn't you? Let's say you lived in that area and your kids were sick. One of your kids were sick or demon-possessed, or whatever the case may be. And this man, you keep hearing this story. This man has been telling this story over and over and over again. And so maybe you do what you would naturally do. You start asking other people. And eventually, you find others who can verify this story. They saw it with their own eyes too. And then you hear that this person that had cast out that demon... And the man was clothed in his right mind, sitting there when those men come back and look at him. And now you hear he's in town and your loved one's sick. You're taking him. You're taking him. I'm taking my dad, right? You're taking somebody in your family that you know is sick. I mean, you're clearing out the ICU, right? Yeah, he's taking everybody you, you, can, you can think of to go see Jesus. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 29. Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. I'm not saying it was just this one man, but I think this one man made a huge difference because he went about telling his story of what Jesus had done for him and how Jesus had compassion on him and other people wanted to meet that Jesus that changed his life completely. Which brings us to our practical application. What I've encouraged you to do in the, in the article, and what I'm encouraging you to do right now, is to actually take the time this week to write down the story of your own salvation. Your own how you started serving Jesus Christ. Write that down. All the things that led up to it, your reasoning behind it. When did you first come to believe that He was the Holy One of God? And when you believed He was the Holy One of God, what did you do? And why did you do it? There is an old practice that when people would write their last will and testimony, testament, they actually would put their story of salvation in there. Because all of their family members would be together for the reading of the will. And as they read the will, all of them would be forced to sit there and listen to the account of why I believed in Jesus and why I lived the life that I lived. So I'm encouraging you to all write that down. And then make a list of all the great things Jesus has done for you. This should not be difficult. Right? This should be a pretty easy exercise. So start making a list of all the great things Jesus has done for you. And even in the worst times of your life, the storms as we talked about earlier, you can sit down and think about the blessings of having a godly father. You can sit down and think about all the great things Jesus has done for you. And then what I want you to do, and, I, and I, I want to do two things here. I want you to tell somebody this week something that Jesus has done for you. Okay? 
maybe somebody you see at the grocery store, maybe a coworker, whatever the case be. Maybe we practice with one another. Maybe we practice when house to house starts back up. Maybe occasionally, we, one of the good things that we want to share is we want to share one of the things Jesus has done for us. And I, and I do want to take just a moment to encourage everyone who has not been part of house to house to really consider being part of that. That is a very helpful uh, thing that the elders have put up here for us to do. And Shelly and I came late to it. The first, it already started a couple weeks before we got here. And I had to leave a couple weeks after it started. So I think I made half of the sessions. But I really found that to be very helpful. And so I want to encourage all of you to do that. Because if we get comfortable telling one another openly and honestly, I want to tell you something that Jesus has done for me. Right? How, is, how much more is that going to make it that much easier for us to just naturally tell people that we come in contact with the world what Jesus has done for us? One of the things that stuck with Shelly and I when we came for the week where we had the porch settings at Herb and Trish's, Trish, uh, Trish's house, Trish's house, was everybody telling their story. I mean, we heard some good stories from a lot of you who are in the building, and that was impressive. Those stories still will have impact on people in the world. Now, it's not just your story that you tell, you, like, like Paul did, right? He shared the gospel, but he also said, how this changed my life and all the good things that God has done for me in my life and Jesus has done for me in my life. One of the things that we are contemplating doing is I want to sit down with some of you and just find out, record you telling me why you came to Jesus and why you became a Christian and use that in some of our efforts to try to reach out to the lost. I think those would be very, very powerful testimonials to why I chose to serve Jesus and what Jesus has done for me. Learning about Jesus is often a process. It was a process for the apostles. They had to be reminded over and over and over and over again just how amazing Jesus really is. And those constant reminders of us telling one another the blessings that Jesus has provided for us and telling people in the world the blessings that Jesus has provided us, our salvation, our guilt-free living, our family relationship with one another, and our, our whatever those blessings are, they're just so big for all of us. And then if that happens enough, I want to know what that, I want to know those blessings too. And then they will come to try to find out more about Jesus. And that's really our goal here. If there's anybody in the audience this morning who has not had that moment with Jesus where you realized He is the Son of the Most High God and what He has done for us is left heaven, came to this earth, lived a perfect, sinless life, and because of my sin and because of your sin, He died so that you could be forgiven, so that you can live that guilt-free life. And the blessings, every spiritual blessings, if you get rid in, into the book of Ephesians, all these spiritual blessings, He just pours on us on a regular basis. We want you to have that. And if you're in the audience this morning and you don't have that, there's no need to, for you to leave here with guilt and the weight of your own sin. Jesus will take that away from you. And if you're a Christian, you haven't been living right, haven't been following after the Lord, and you want to come back to Him and just be thankful for the great blessings He has done for you, if we can help you in any way, we ask you to come as we stand and sing. Heart, blood, and voice of Jesus, all